everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another Falconer video. Today's video, I'm going to be talking about my favorite hawk to fly, which is a Cooper's hawk. Uh, arguably the best and worst raptor to fly in the United States. Uh, really a fascinating bird. Uh, before I get into it, if you haven't already, if you could hit subscribe, I very much appreciate it. It helps me keep this channel up and going. And to jump right in, the Cooper's hawk. First of all, let's talk a little bit about what they are and why they're the best and the worst raptor you could fly. Uh, when we're talking about hawks, of course, I, in, in the United States, we use the hawk a little too universally. True hawks are the forest hawks, or the occipiters. Now, uh, we have three of them in the United States. We have the northern goshawk, which I did a video on last week, uh, which is now the North American goshawk. That's been recently changed. Uh, that's the biggest. Uh, in the middle, we have the Cooper's hawk. And then the smallest we have is the sharpshin hawk. Now, uh, Cooper's hawks and sharpshin hawks look kind of similar. Uh, a lot of times uh, for people looking at it, it's like, wait a minute, which one's which? Especially, well, both are first year and adult plumage. First year, goshawks, Cooper's hawks, and sharpshin hawks all basically have the same coloration. But as adults, goshawks have the silver and the gray, where Cooper's hawks and sharpshin hawks uh, are red-chested and kind of slaty gray on the back. And that is given the false understanding by people that, oh, they must be really closely related. I bet a Cooper's and a Sharpshin are more closely related than they are to a Goss. Genetics have proven that not to be true. It turns out that actually Sharpshin hawks, genetically speaking, came directly from Eurasian sparrow hawks and are not closely related to Cooper's hawks at all. Meanwhile, Cooper's hawks themselves are directly branched off from North American goshawks. The colors don't look it, but when you start to look at the pigmentation patterns, especially like if you're doing it black and white, if you were looking at uh, an adult goss coopers and sharp shin hawk, black and white photos, you'd start to recognize, oh, the pigmentation patterns, the math behind the pigmentation overlays, they match up and it makes sense. And in fact, <clears throat> coopers hawks, and northern goshawks will interbreed in the wild. Happens with some frequency. Uh, obviously being elusive birds, we don't notice all the time when it happens, but bird banders will regularly trap and <clears throat> recognize these uh, these individuals. So the Cooper's hawk is being an occipiter, being a true hawk, being a forest hawk. What is it built like? Well, first of all, it's built for the forest, which means very short, com well, comparatively short rounded wings. You want short wings, long wings don't do well going through trees. You want short wings and a very long tail. The longer your tail, the more maneuverable you are. So everything about this is about flash and dash, diving in and out of the trees. And uh, with that kind of ability, you also have to have a high frame rate. Hesipiters have the highest frame rates of any of the raptors. And it is arguably true, I don't know how much this has been tested, but a Cooper's hawk arguably has the fastest frame rate of any United States occipiter. That means the amount of visual information they process. Uh, for example, if I wave my hand right now on this video, you see a motion blur. Cooper's hawk would not see a motion blur. It would just, it would be as clear as that, but it would be full speed. There, Because they, they pick up more visual frames per second than we do. This is really good for chasing birds, which is what they're built to do. Now, Cooper's hawks can hunt all kinds of things. They're incredibly versatile, both in the wild and as a falconry bird. However, they are built for birds. They're built to kill birds. Now, they can hunt prey bird-wise as small as a sparrow, all the way up to a pheasant. You know, uh, you'd be hard pressed to have them hold down a pheasant, uh, but it's something they can do. With mammals, uh, in the wild, they'll hunt prey. Uh, I've, I know a pair that hunts many years almost exclusively chipmunks. They're by this region, this little canyon that just happens to be filled at the bottom of the canyon with a bajillion chipmunks. And that's what they hunt because it's available. It's a resource. Um, I know a friend in California who, when he flies a Cooper's Hawk, at the end of the season, and I'll get to this with feathers, uh, he's like, hey, you know, I got like two, week, two weeks left in my hunting season before I put my Cooper's Hawk up for the molt. I'm just going to let it hunt jackrabbits because it wants to. And its feathers are going to get busted up in the process, but it doesn't matter because it's about to grow in a new set and not be hunting for the summer. So, again, there's no way on earth a Cooper's Hawk can overpower jackrabbit but he lets it chase it catch it and then he runs up dispatches the rabbit and that's pretty impressive so this for, for me size wise i love to hunt quail and quail really the cooper's hawk is the perfect bird to hunt quail uh both in terms of their speed their ability their size 
and their ability to pursue on the ground, in cover. And so if you think of a quail as the perfect pairing with the Cooper's Hawk, and you can go up or down from there, hunting sparrows, English sparrows is a blast with them. It is so much fun. But I'm getting a little off topic. This is a bird hunter with a high frame rate, and it is a bird with a long tail, short rounded wings, and it has stamina like you wouldn't believe. It can get up and go. Now, there's a famous author, uh, Mike McDermott, who's written several books on occipiters, including the imprint occipiter, and he refers to Cooper's Hawks as feathered rattlesnakes. I like that view. I, li I think that's actually a good way to view them. Uh, if you look at these birds in field guides, they're always illustrated too poofy, too fluffy, too burly. <clears throat> they're just, they're all bone and sinew and tendon. They're just, they're just these wiry, springy things. They're not like, I have a hawk on my fist. It's like they're, they're uh, yeah, you have to hold one to understand. But they're, they're, they're just like these coiled rattlesnakes with springs and rocket engines that just lunge out. And their abilities allow them to get up and go and chase and chase. It's not just, oh, I'm chasing. It's, it's literally like this, if need be. Crash through brush, boom, I missed. Bird gets away, okay, I'm going to get up and, brrr, and keep going and still catch you. That's not normal. Most raptors will have an initial attempt, and if they miss, it's like, well, I missed. <clears throat> now that the, the prey is getting ahead. Cooper's hawks will miss, crash on the ground, and be like, rah, 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 and we'll just go and still catch up to their prey. That makes them a very desirable hunting companion in that way. So they're, they're, they're really, really incredible in their abilities uh, in the wild and as a falconer bird and the prey that they can get. Now remember the rule is, with all raptors, a falconer is going to have the most success if you hunt a bird native to your area, common to your area, and you hunt it on prey common to your area, and it's prey that this species normally hunts in the wild. So for me, I got a lot of cooper's hawks, I got a lot of quail, cooper's hawks normally hunt quail, and you're going to have a lot of success in that sort of circumstance. Or on the other hand, if you live in an area with almost no ponds and almost no fish and you're going to try something interesting like training an osprey like Ken and McClendon does, uh, which I've done videos on that, you're not going to have a lot of success because you need the right opportunities. The good thing about a Cooper's Hawk is there's all kinds of opportunities everywhere. Maybe you live in an urban environment and you're hunting pigeons in barns or you get contracts and talk to... Uh, you know, big rentals where under the eaves, where the, the, the loading docks for, I mean, I've talked to grocery stores a lot and the loading docks for the semi-trucks are swarming with pigeons. And I'm like, hey, can I come hunt your pigeons with my hawk? And they're like, yeah, sure. Can we watch? Absolutely. Uh, that It works with a Cooper's hawk. There's opportunities to hunt everything. Almost every region I can think of has got some sort of prey, mammalian or bird, that a Cooper's Hawk can take advantage of with a falconer. So why doesn't everybody and their dog fly one of these birds? Well, let's get into that a little bit. Let's talk about that because it's one of those things where uh, if you're getting into it, a lot of people start to learn their raptors and they learn of a Cooper's Hawk and start to say, that's what I want, that, that's what, mm -mm. no. This bird, in my opinion, and, and again, depends on what age you're training them from, but regardless of what age, this bird, in my opinion, it's, it's not doctrine, everybody has a different view, is the hardest bird to train correctly without having excessive baggage, excessive problems, excessive aggression. Uh, and this is not a beginner's bird at all. Not in any way, shape, or form. You can get them hunting, and let me, let me put it this way. Getting a bird, getting Cooper's Hawk up and hunting is easy. They're like, okay, then I'm having success. This bird holds grudges. If you make a mistake, they hold a grudge. And it, they will let you know. They will attack you if you've, if you've done something wrong. And they will hold that grudge forever. It's not an easy grudge to smooth over. Also, I teach in all my videos that aggression is not a bad thing. Aggression is a necessary thing, but aggression must be directed, not eliminated, properly directed. Where? Towards prey. I mean, towards, towards a lure maybe, but towards prey. This is the easiest bird, in my opinion, to incorrectly direct the aggression, and then it'll turn around, and that aggression will accidentally come out on you. And you could have a Cooper's Hawk leave its kill, come running over and claw its way up your leg all the way to your face. Not good. Uh, so if it's done right, you're, you, you can have a great experience. But if it's done wrong, there's a problem. So 
I love this bird, but don't just run out and get excited by this video and be like, that's what I gotta get for my next bird. So let's talk about, again, the abilities. You can hunt all day, every day with this bird. You can hunt a wide range of prey. You're going to have success. If you're not having success with a Cooper's Hawk, you're doing something wrong. It is not hard to get them up and hunting, especially with such amazing prey avail availability for the species everywhere. So that's not the problem. There's nothing but good to say on that end. But here are some things to consider. First of all, like all occipiters, but seemingly excessively so, they have very brittle feathers. It's very easy for them to break their tail feathers. That is a consideration. Uh, you, you, do you have feathers to imp and repair if they broke a feather? Do you have a setup for a tail guard or, or a good housing situation, a good transporting plan that you can use that will work for them? Because otherwise, they and even just hunting on kill, they might uh, break a tail feather. So that's something to consider. They do not hood well. And some of them, if you're trying to hood train them, they might take that as a huge offense that they will hold as a grudge for you for months. And they won't, you'll lose all the trust and the acclimation you've built. And they're just so mad at you that how dare you? How dare you? You tried to hood me once. So it's not just a matter of, well, I got to properly hood train the bird. Some, a lot of Cooper's Hawks, they, they do not do well with being hooded at all and will hold it against you. Uh, so those are a couple considerations. Uh, like I said, already aggression. Uh, if you train them, if you misdirect the aggression and don't hunt enough, which really need to be hunting them every day, multiple times a day, it's going to come out on you. You're going to get harmed. You're going to get hurt. So in addition to that, if you get a baby, a first-year bird, it's very difficult to train them without them being vocal. Now, there, here's a couple of options with, with, with any occipiter like this, whether captive bred or from the wild. You can pull a young baby. You could pull an older baby. You could pull a brancher. You could pull a family bird, which is the ideal, which is when they're just leaving. The parents are trying to get rid of them. They're like, come on, follow me out to the forest. Start doing your own hunting. And they're, they're learning on their own. And if at that age, if you can hone in and find one of those birds, catch that, perfect. Next would be a passage bird, which is when they've totally left the the grove and their family care and they're on their own, but you want an early passage. Then there's a late passage, not a good choice. Uh, those are kind of your options. Of all of those, the very best is a family bird, which again is a bird raised by the family and it's in the process of being left by the parents. That's the best age to get. Any age can be trained, but any of these other ages can be very prone to being vocal. If you get one that's fully passage and on its own, it's very trainable, but you really want to get as early in the season as you can, like September. If you don't, uh, your your chances of them getting asper, a, a, a respiratory disease called asper, go through the roof, and they never fully calm down and trust you. And it's all about building trust. Even if you get the right weight, more than any other raptor, uh, this is a bird that you are never going to have fully trained and fully dialed in and fully have the proper weight. This is a bird that is, you're, you're constantly adjusting. The bird's like this, okay, and then you, you do this, you do this, you're adjusting. You're fine tuning the weight the whole time. You're feeding a little more on the lure. Oh, they're too aggressive on the lure, a little less on the lure. Oh, that I'm gonna put nothing on the lure at all. And then when they land on the lure, I'll drop food next to it and have them hop off and then pull the lure away. And then there's nothing on the ground for them to be aggressive of. Oh, but that, they started to not be interested in the lure at all. I'm gonna put food back on the lure, a ton of it. These are the kind of things. Or how much do you let them eat off a kill? They need, the more times they kill, hunt, 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 I caught something. 10 minutes later, I caught another something. 10 minutes later, I caught another something. You gotta let them eat each time. The more you let them eat on a kill, the more determined of a hunter they are going to be. But the more kills numerically they have, the, the more the aggression has been properly directed at prey. So this is a balancing act. You gotta let them feed more so they'll pursue enough to actually get something. But you have to feed less so that you can give as many opportunities for chase and aggression to be directed at prey instead of at your face. So this is these are all factors. Like I said, with all raptors, but especially occipiters, and especially, especially with Cooper's hawks, you need to find someone who has or is flying a Cooper's hawk because you need another mind to talk with you and you to talk to them and you bounce ideas off and you troubleshoot and you're like, I, I, I'm, I'm frustrated. 
I don't know, my bird's doing this weird behavior, and I don't know what to do about it. And then the other person, who knows the mind of a Cooper's, can talk through it with you, and you bounce those ideas off, and you realize, oh, here's what it is. Ah, then you come up with a, a hypothesis and a game plan. You execute that game plan, and you're like, oh, hey, it works. You both log that in. You really kind of need that in order to properly fly a Cooper's Hawk. They're incredible birds. Um, and again, my favorite bird to fly is Cooper's Hawk by far, but I typically don't fly one if I have any other bird because they are so intense and require so much uh, troubleshooting nonstop to work through things. Uh, but uh, readily available everywhere. Everywhere in the United States has some Cooper's Hawks. Uh, you know, they, they just, they're, and even though they're built for the forest, you can hunt them anywhere. Total open country. Uh, you probably have one nesting in your neighborhood and you don't even know it. They, they live everywhere, they hunt everything, and they're highly successful. So I wanted to share this video just to uh, kind of give a little more updated intro to the Cooper's Hawk. Uh, again, I, I love it when I see people flying them. I just like to make sure people always know what they're getting into because again, this is a bird that you do not want to do wrong. It's very important to do it right and to keep adjusting and to be fully planned for what you're going to have to invest before you ever get one. But I hope you love the video. If you have any comments or questions, let me know uh, down below. Uh, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe. And as always, happy hawking.